Hello. Thank you for joining us today. I am Joseph Glazer, Deputy Commissioner of the Westchester County Department of Community Mental Health. The purpose that we have come together for this is to train individuals and help them understand how the service system in Westchester County works to assist those with behavioral health needs. Unfortunately, our service system in this nation, state and county, are very disjointed. And part of the goal of this is to bring all of the service providers together and help them understand how our various service systems work. Individuals with behavioral health needs have very few singular needs. What I mean by that is that people have multiple needs. So as we go through these trainings, we will work with you to help you understand how our service system works, how you help people get benefits, how you help people get housing, how you help people get connected with the services that they need, whether they're mental health needs, substance use needs, developmental or in intellectual disability needs, all of the things that we know people need to improve their lives and to move forward on the road to recovery. We have broken this program up into three separate units. The first one is really an explanation of the services that are available. The second one is how we access the benefits that will help cover the cost and pay for the expenses of providing the, these services. The third one is a very important one as well. It is how you, as a healthcare provider working in the community, can keep yourself safe. We thank you again for joining us, and I look forward to working with you as we go forward to make our world a better place for the people we serve. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for being here. This is our third and what we hope will be an ongoing series of training programs that are geared to help people working in the field. We're looking to help care managers, case managers, individuals who on a day-to-day -day basis are serving people that we are all collectively trying to connect with a service system, with a care system, with hope for recovery. That's why we're all doing this. I want to thank all of you for joining us in that effort on, on behalf of the Department of Community Mental Health. Um, also on behalf of County Executive George Latimer, DCMH Commissioner Michael Orth, uh, we welcome you to this. Um, we will be joined today by Kelly Darrow, a good friend and colleague with HDSW for today's safety training. I want to thank, uh, out at the front desk, my assistant Malika Richards, who has helped pull all of these things together. I'd also like to thank Desh Edwards, who has done a great job in making these events possible um, to make sure that the information that's being shared with you working in the community is what you need to most effectively do the work that you are doing. I just want to take a couple of minutes and talk about, more than anything, the world we currently live in. As many of you know, we had to postpone this event due to yet another outbreak of a COVID variant. If you take that not in terms of how it affects us, but how it affects the community we collectively serve, it means that it's more difficult as an individual seeking services, it's more difficult to connect. The fear you have for your own health is greater. The fear you have for your own well-being is greater. The fear you have of contracting a virus is greater. The system is growing more remote. The system is growing more distant. It's harder to find a safe place to live, to reside, to have a roof over your head. That's the system that we are working in today. And there is no doubt about it. It is more difficult than it was two and a half years ago. So as we talk about safety, we don't do this because there's some inherent sa safety issues in the population we're serving. In fact, it's just the opposite. There are studies out there that say that the people we serve, absent substance misuse, are many times more likely to be the victim of violence than the perpetrator of violence. Many times more likely to be the victim. But when you are a care provider, when you are working with people in the community, it only takes once. That's why we're here. That's what we're here to talk about. 
is if you do your job and you do it well, there's a very strong possibility that the most intensive things you will learn here today, you will never use. But what you will also learn along the way is how to use the ways to protect yourself and the people that you work with so you never get to that point. And that's equally as important. For me, I come to this from a slightly different background, although I am the de Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Community Mental Health. I've spent many years as a mental health advocate and also many years in the private practice of law as an attorney. I've had those situations, particularly working in family court. For those of you who have been or will be working with court-involved people, sometimes this comes up because, not because, again, people are inherently dangerous, but you take all the stressors of the world we live in right now and you throw in court involvement and the pressures and stress of court involvement and you have now amped up anxiety, you have amped up fear, you have amped up a potential for someone to lash out. Those are the things that you have to keep track of in your own mind, in your own index of keeping yourself and the people that you work with safe. Because this isn't just about keeping you safe. This is about the people that you work with being safe too. So when I think about that, one of the stories that comes to mind, <clears throat> many years ago, I was in Albany County Family Court. I was assigned by the court to represent a man who had spent 14 years in federal prison. And he had both mental health needs, which by the way, any of you who have ever known anyone who has spent 14 years in federal prison, you may not even have had mental health issues when you go in, but you certainly are likely to when you come out. And this individual had a substance issue, had gotten out, and within a short period of time of getting out, had a baby, and now they were in a custody fight. And she was making a whole bunch of allegations against this, this gentleman, and I had no idea whether or not they were true because you really can't tell initially. What I did know was that he had been identified as having substance use issues. So he and I are meeting in this little tiny conference room I have a social work intern with me who is maybe five foot tall, probably, what, 22 years old, first year master's student. And she and I are in the conference room, and we're in there with this guy, and he's telling me that he's done everything he's supposed to do, and he's not doing drugs. And I said, well, if you've done everything you're supposed to do, then show me the paperwork from city court so that we can see that the order of protection has been lifted, all of these things that you get to deal with when you deal with justice-involved people. He reaches in his pocket, takes a wad of papers and he throws them on this little table in the conference room. Marijuana roach goes bouncing across the table and lands on the floor, having come out of his pocket and his papers. And I just kind of bend over and I pick it up and I said, so it says you're doing everything you're supposed to do. What about the substance use issues that were identified? Oh, I don't really have any of those. I took the roach and I threw it into the middle of the table and I said, listen, until you can be honest with yourself and you can be honest with me, there's really nothing I can do for you and he lost it. Slams the door of this little tiny conference room and starts screaming at me. Intern is frozen in the corner, fortunately, behind me. And I'm just sitting there. And I just kept telling him, trapping all of us in this conference room isn't going to help you either. I had a colleague afterwards in another room who told me, all I could hear was this guy screaming and you just repeating, trapping all of us in this conference room isn't going, and she said, you said it like five times. Within probably 30 seconds, the door to that conference room gets pushed open from the outside. Four court officers drag him out, and now he's screaming something else. All you MFers want to do is put me back in prison. And I looked at him and I said, listen, nobody here wants to put you in prison. We want you to deal with your court issues. We want you to deal with your substance issues. And if you do those things and come back and do what you're supposed to do, I'll be able to get you visitation. But nobody wants to put you in prison. So we go in, we have a conversation with the judge, he goes out the door. Two months later, we have a nine o'clock appearance, I walk into the courthouse at 8.30 in the morning, he comes bounding up the steps, running up to me, Mr. Glazer, Mr. Glazer, I gotta show you something. And it's like, that's great, let me um, set my, take my coat off, collect myself, I'll be right back. So I come back and he hands me all these papers. It's his evaluation. It's his medication prescription, a copy of his medication prescription. It's the receipt for having that prescription filled. 
It's the name of his therapist and the schedule of meeting with his therapist. And I look at him and I go, you did it. He went, well, of course you did it. Of course I did it. You told me if I didn't do it, I wasn't going to get to see my kid. That was just a moment in time for him where he was so angry and so frustrated that his behavior became potentially dangerous. He's not a dangerous individual. I was never afraid of him. But I was for a moment in a situation that was unsafe. It may never happen to you. But what we're doing here today is giving you the tools that you need so that should you find yourself in a situation like that, you know how to handle it. So I thank you all again for being here. I welcome you for being here. And just a very quick reminder, we are taping this because we will use this for, for uh, future uh, employees, staff, people who come into your role after this. Um, so this is being taped. I just want to give you the heads up. Um, but at the same time, I'm telling you this is being recorded. I'm also going to tell you we're going to work really hard to get you all engaged in conversation here. So we appreciate that as well. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Dash and thank you all very much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Joe. Hi, everybody. So thank you again for coming today. Um, we really appreciate you taking the break between the months and still remembering to show up this, month, this day. Um, today we're going to have Kelly Darrow do a presentation on safety and de-escalation. I've seen Kelly do a couple presentations. She's a really good presenter and trainer. Um, I've known her for about 15 years now. Um, she's very skilled and I'm really looking forward to this presentation. So I hope you guys will get a lot out of today and take away a lot of useful skills. And I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly. Good morning. Okay, as I said, if you're in the back, there's a risk we're gonna call on you. So I love training, I love presentations, but for me, I can't talk and look at slides. I really need some, some help from people. So Joe and I wanted to start today by just finding out who's in the room. So I'm just gonna do some raise your hand. So raise your hand if you've worked in the field for more than 10 years. Oh, impressive, okay. Anybody more than 20 years? Wow. Okay, so we're gonna talk to you, to you guys about what's different. Was there anything that was different? We'll do this later. Different later, different now, and, and different than today. Anybody who's been working in the field less than two years? Okay, nobody started during COVID, right? Because people who started working during COVID are a whole special cohort of employees. So today we're gonna talk about a few different things. So I'm much older than I look. This is where you have to say how young I look. Um, I started working about 30 years ago in Bronx Family Court. So I, had my social work degree. I thought that that was gonna protect me for absolutely everything that there was. So I worked with the law guardians who represented kids. Our jobs were often to do home visits to biological homes, to foster homes. My supervisor said, okay, here's a caseload. I was there three years, I had about 400 families. Here, go in the community and go visit them. I didn't have a clue. I also grew up in central New York. I moved down here to go to graduate school. My whole life fell apart when I came here because living here is much different than the cows in the backyard where I grew up. So here's my supervisors who think I know how to go to make home visits. So I learned everything the hard way, the wrong way, had some incidents we'll talk, talk about later. And then a few years later, I came to work at a agency here in Westchester. And in the old days, care management was called ICM, intensive case management, supportive case management. There was some major incident that happened in a part of New York State, and all of a sudden OMH says you have to have some safety protocols. You have to have a training, you have a protocol or procedure. So fast forward, how long ago was that, Dash? Was that 20 years ago? So 20 years ago. So fast forward, I know that my agency started, we had policies and procedures and practices and training. I haven't heard about that in a really, really long time. So it's not forgotten, but I really appreciate that the county is bringing this training back. But when I look at some of my old slides, I did safety training before people had beepers and cell phones. That's how old I am. So it's interesting when I was looking at the slides this morning, it's really, my slides are old. So what's different now than doing home visits or being in the field 20 years ago? What's different now? I'm looking at you. So 
so the clients are more concerning now or more concerning then? Okay. Okay, so we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about clients who are symptomatic. What else might be different between the old days and now? Safety. So give me two lines about safety. What's different now? Oh, okay. About your own personal safety, right? And what else? So more, more street stuff, stuff is going on in the streets and in the communities. Yep. So part of worker safety, we're going to talk about that. And what were we going to add? Technology. Technology is different. Tell me one line about that. What, what makes that better or worse? And Zoom and telehealth, right. So even in the last two years, are concerned about COVID, their concerns about COVID, telehealth, changed how we do work. But there's a couple really big things that have happened in the last few years which impact us as well. Tell me what, you have something? I think the biggest change in the world is that more people are in crisis and it's Exactly. So when we talk about worker safety or crisis de-escalation, it's not really about those people that we work with. It's about us as well. So it's always about our reaction. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is one of my favorite quotes from a long time ago. So armed with our only concern. That's all we have, really. We don't have guns. We don't have anything. I was a family court ordered me to do a home visit once, and they ordered probation to go. I went by myself. The probation officer, his gun and his supervisor all showed up in the same home visit. That didn't really make sense. Why did he get to have a gun on a home visit and they just sent me? I was much safer on the home visit than he was because they didn't think I was a threat. So a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is our perception of things, somebody else's perceptions of things, but we really only go with our concern. So we're gonna talk a lot about safety and understanding safety and assessing early on. So I've put together a couple different PowerPoints. I apologize, we're gonna skip through a couple different things, but, um, uh oh okay. So we're gonna to start today talking about the things you, so being in the community, being in the field, and then we're gonna talk about some techniques and de-escalation. Um, all right, I don't like these slides here. Yeah, ma'am. I don't like technology. I like when we had small groups and presentation. So for people who don't know, the bathrooms are up around the corner. We'll take a break at some point when I switch PowerPoints, but if people feel like they need to leave, please go. Um, I had to put cell phones in there because in the beginning of training, nobody ever had cell phones when I started. So, you know, I know we're all very important. We all need our phones. I'm hoping that you can only take emergency calls. Um, and we are expecting some participation. So thank you for participating. Come on. So we talked about who you are. So people are new to the agency. Are there any supervisors here or program directors? Okay, so we're gonna pick on your brains a little bit. Is this the first time you're attending a safety training at your current agency? And it, does your agency do its own safety trainings of any kind? Okay, those are good things. So we're gonna talk about that. Um, so. In a smaller group, I would spend some time thinking about incidents of violence, how you personally experience them and professionally. We don't need to do that today. But so when we talk about violence, Joe highlighted this for me. It's not always who we're visiting, sometimes it's where we're visiting. Um, we used to do this training and there was often people who identified themselves as peers. They identified themselves um, with their own lived experience. And one of the peers once said to me, I'm really offended that you're talking about visit me and you're concerned about your safety. So think about that. We're visiting people. We have to look at the community and look at those kind of places, but we're visiting people where they live. 
So it's often about whether they feel unsafe as well. So I went to visit a family in one of those you know, buildings that people talked about, oh, be careful when you go there. Um, the family met me downstairs. Mom was, grandma was very fragile. She was about 75. She helped me figure out which elevator to take and don't take these stairs. And we went into the apartment and she had about 10 locks. The door lock, this lock, this lock, this, a click, 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 click. And the top one had a key and that key went so we had an opportunity. So I'm just meeting with her. I'm engaging with her. I don't want to say you have to leave that door unlocked, but what I said is, that's a lot of locks. And it was a nice opportunity for her to talk about why she needed so many locks. So they've been robbed. There's been people who've broken in their apartment. But I also learned pretty quickly that she also had some serious psychiatric symptoms herself. I was there to see her grandson. So my work with her was not to say you have to keep that unlocked. My work with her was, that top lock, do you think we could put that key over here? Because in case of a fire, other people need to get out. So her grandson was a fire setter. So here's a kid with fire setting behavior, and she's the only one that can get the family out of the house. So that was my work with them, was where can the key be put? So in case there's an emergency, everybody in the family can get out. But who would have guessed that that was the first three weeks of my work with them, is how I feel safe in the apartment and I can escape if I need to, but how they can get out safety. So safety is not always about behavioral things and it's not always about psychiatric symptoms. Sometimes it's about where we go and where people live. So when I look at this training, there's a couple areas that are not in my training because I didn't know about these five, six, seven, ten years ago. So if I say the word social determinants of health, what does that mean? What are some social determinants of health? We're going to add that in your training, Stash. So social determinants health are really about those things that people have access to or not. So everybody during the pandemic has talked about food insecurity, right? So that's one thing. So when people are in crisis and escalating crisis, sometimes it's because they're not getting some basic needs. Mark Giuliano will tell lots of stories about the people showing up on a Friday because DSS didn't give them their food stamps. That's a crisis for some people. So social determinants of health, but also tr people with trauma history. So how people react, how we react, is often related to other experiences in our life. So we're going to add that into our, our training topics. Um, come on. Oh, going the wrong way again, Kelly. Come on. Joe, do you want to do the clicker? Do you want me to do it? I will gladly it doesn't do. work for me. Oh, there we go. Okay, so when, so let's think about home visits first. Let's think about all the work that we need to do. So when you're getting ready to go in the, on a home visit, what are all the things that you have to do before you go? Say that again? Check the area if you've never been there. Maybe to check even though you've been there a lot because what happens in some of the communities? Things change by the weather, right? A community has a totally different feel in the winter than it does in the spring, than it does when it's light, when it's dark, when it's raining. So one of the things, there's a few things that I'm gonna highlight that people need to remember is, just cause you've been there before, doesn't mean it's gonna be the same. Just cause you've made that home visit, does not mean it's gonna be the same. And just because you think the family likes you, you have a relationship with them and they trust you, it might not always be the same. So I'm going to tell a quick story. I worked with, a, when I first started, I had a very small caseload. So I got to do some very intensive work with some families who were involved with social services, often child protection, um, some neglect. So four kids, mom was a working, mom was working on her LPN, mom was very busy. And I really feel like kind of mom and I raised the kids. So I would often do visits at, at five o'clock at night, which was part of my job because mom was in school and that's when the kids needed some extra support so one morning unsurprisingly unsurpri i had to go pick up one of the youngest kids we were going to the zoo on a trip again another program that i worked in so i pull up and they live on the second floor and all i hear is yelling and screaming so what do you think i did went up and knocked on the door i did of course i I'm the social worker. I know this family. I know them. They love me. I've, done, I've been to this house five million times. I not only went up the stairs, there was no door because the door was ripped off the hinges. I still went in. So what I found was the 16-year-old girl was attempting to beat the crap out of her 12-year-old brother. I still went in because I was going to say, 
Sarah, stop, 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 stop. That didn't work. She wasn't listening. She barely even knew I was there. So I said, all right, now the next thing is I'm going to get him into his bedroom, and I'm going to go in the bedroom, and I'm going to block the door. Now, I'm not a small woman. She broke the door down. The door goes, I go, my keys go, she's beating on him. Not once did I think I, maybe I should leave the house and call 911, because I was going to fix this. Now, in hindsight, I know differently. So, the, so she finally got exhausted and stopped, because when people are in crisis, eventually they can't sustain that. So she stopped. He was calm, and I'm bleeding. I don't know when that happened. So at some point, I got an, an, an elbow to the nose. So now I'm bleeding. They have no ice. I still haven't left the house because I can't find my keys. And it was the beginning of cell phones. I left my work cell phone in the car. So in hindsight, I did that all wrong. But what I really thought is because I've been there before, because I knew them, that was not what I should have done. I don't know that it was a police intervention. But if the police had been with me, maybe the, out the outcome would have been different. So I know this family now 30 years. That teenage girl who is now a grandmother will say, it's your fault. You came in. She said, I did what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to beat my brother that day. So it's all those things that I knew. And I was doing safety training at that time. I knew I shouldn't. But it really went back to it was about me at that moment. I thought I could do something. So in all of this, you have to think about yourself. It's not just about the client. OK, go. I could tell stories all day. Move me along. See? I don't, I don't think it's you. I think it may be the Okay. No, it just, here, let me. Maybe too close. We're on it. We're on it. Okay. okay. I just go the wrong way. We'll go back to the beginning. Okay. Maybe Malika can get the. All right, here we go. So, um, maybe you can just sit there. And it's this one that moves it along. Yeah. So, continuum of violence. Actually, I have to put on another slide. Hang on. Okay. We got this. We're good. Keep in mind, we're professionals. <laughs> <laughs> so before I start, so in a continuum of violence, tell me, so, tell me some things that are violent. What are so? If you think about the most minimal to the most serious, tell me. Just throw out some words about what violence is. Assault, right? Yes, it's violence. Threaten. What else? Control, power and control issues, yep. Escalating anger. Escalating anger. How about bullying? Is that considered violence? Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to put a, a quick slide on the continuum because it's helpful. Nope. Nope. Keep going. Uh, I, I'm not going to do that. So if you think about a continuum, insults, and somewhere in there are microaggressions, right? Years ago, nobody talked about microaggressions. But where is that in a continuum? It can start and it can continue. So when we're looking about violence, it doesn't have to be I got assaulted or somebody was assaultive or somebody was threatening. We have to really think, and it's, often it's about communication, right? So when we talk about de-escalation skills, there's a lot about how we're communicating with people. We're going to talk about body language. We're going to talk about language. We're going to talk about tone of voice. Um, I work at a program in Mamaroneck called The Living Room, which is a day crisis respite program. People often come to us in crisis. And I say that sometimes people's quiet, crisis is quiet, and sometimes it's loud. So we have somebody who's very loud. I know a very long time. He's very threatening. He's all hopped up on steroids because he likes to work out in addition to all of his paranoia and the aliens are coming. So I'm in a room with him, but everybody else needs quiet because they're in crisis. So I'm with another staff member. We close the door and the other staff member and I are sitting down. I am not at all feeling threatened. And I'm like Joe saying, I'm saying the same thing. I'm talking about what he needs from us right now. I'm talking about how to make him feel safe. But I'm also asking him to be quieter because other people are getting upset. But what happened is the other people in the rest of the program couldn't hear my soft voice. They thought he had killed me. So the people from the other part of the program are coming in. They barge in because they thought something had happened. And for me, it wasn't a crisis for me. I was managing my own response, which was helping him be calmer. 
So one of the questions we're going to talk about is I statements. How are you feeling at the time? So before you get into something that feels big and ugly and scary, you have to identify how you're feeling also. And it's also about our past experience. You're all care managers, is that where you work? Care management, clinics, I work in residential. Where do you get your information about an individual? From where? From progress notes, from the SPOA referral, from clinicals that could be 100 years old. They could be new. So go the other way. You're trying to make a referral for somebody, and you have to write a psychosocial, and they have a long history of assaultive. How do you write that in a psychosocial? So what I always say is, we only know what we know. So we get a SPOA referral, it's in the clinicals. Sometimes clinicals make it sound worse, sometimes they make it sound better. So Joe, do you have any insight about clinical material and how it comes and looking at clinical material related to this? Looking at clinical material? Or looking, like what do we get? So somebody new is oh, being okay. referred to me. So well, I always say past violence is the most powerful predictor of violence. It's interesting because from a departmental perspective, I'm, I think these are on, but I'm not sure. I'll come up there anyway. Just because I do what Kelly tells me to do. So from a, from a departmental perspective, it's really interesting because one of the things that we see is right now our system largely works in a silo. We find ourselves completely reliant on the information provided to us by the people that we work with. So unless a person tells you, for example, that they have a history of violent criminal conviction or something along those lines, that's something that is difficult for you to be able include, to include as you're developing the picture that you need for the person you are working with. So I think your point is that you frequently begin with far less information than you need and very few opportunities to actually gather that information. Is that where you were going with that? Yeah. Okay. And, and sometimes the material is either underestimates what you might think or sometimes overestimates. Yeah. So the material is the material. But I go back, if there's somebody in a SPO referral or clinical that talks about 15 arrests for assault, prior assault in a residential program, we have to know that when we're going, but it doesn't mean I'm necessarily going with my armor on it because I think that person is going to assault me. So it's the history, it's the expectation, but a lot of this is really going to be about you using your best judgment. Now I'm not saying your best clinical judgment because we're not all clinicians. Your best judgment. So there's research that talks about using your gut. So you have to learn to trust your gut. Now, when you do work in the field, I have had people who said, interviews, I can do this, I can do home visits. They go in one home visit and they said, I'm never going out in the field again. And then there's people who go do home visits and go visit people in the community with not looking out for their own safety at all. And as a supervisor, I say, what were you doing? So everything is on a continuum. I have been that worker who I put myself in these situations not once did a supervisor go, you shouldn't have been there because as a supervisor, there's a piece of like, look at that great work Joe is doing. Now I would say, Joe, you're setting yourself up and it's also not helping the client. So this is very complicated work we do and it's very complicated work we do for people who are new in the field, but people new in the field are often the ones who becomes care managers, right? We expect this, you have this experience, it's all, we're gonna go back to those arrows. It's all back there again. Go ahead, Dash. I like telling Dash what to do. In the 20, 25 years I spent doing private practice, the line that I think I said to clients the most when I was doing matrimonial work, family law work, criminal work, I think the line that I said most to individuals was this. What did you think was going to happen? You need to keep that in the back of your mind because you need to think about, among other things, how the work that you're doing, the situations you're in, how all of those things play out. So you do need to think about what could happen. Okay. I'm going to go get the guy. Okay. 
All right, so I'm going to officially wing it until we get the guy. So let's talk about making home visits. So somebody talked about leaving your agency. You leave your agency with some information, right? What do we know? We know the address. Maybe you have a phone number that works. What's your first contact often with a client? Do you call them? Do you just show up? Tell me what, what it, most agencies do. You call them. So how do you introduce yourself? Mm -hmm. So while Desh is out of the room, I know Jen is here. We've been getting SPOAs, and it's been COVID. So sometimes the SPOAs are two years old. People were in the hospital, a referral was made. I'm finding that when we make those initial calls, people don't have a clue who I am and why I'm calling. And then we had people who were somewhat suspicious. So engaging them on the phone about what our role is is really, really important. So when I go on home visits, people for a long time often thought I was CPS. I guess I just look like a CPS worker. I have some staff member who say every time I go, they think I'm a cop, I look like a cop. So there's some perceptions about who we are. So engaging the people on the phone, hopefully, is really an important part about why you're coming, what your goals would be for that day, and just to say, so how do you, is there a doorbell to ring? Where should I park my car? So sometimes engaging people about where they live is really important. So you call somebody on the phone, they're expecting you, then what? What are some other things you do? Be on time, right? That's respectful. If you're gonna be late, maybe call. Um, do you confirm that morning before you go? I hear some staff say, if you don't call me back, I'm not coming. I might ask them to do a little bit different language because you still haven't even met the person, but even if you've met them, so as a supervisor, we don't want people wasting the time if the client isn't there, but there's lots of reasons why the client might an not answer the phone. So this, this part of the presentation today, there's really no right and wrong answer, and it'd be interesting if agencies kind of have different philosophies. So I hear our staff calling to confirm appointments. We suggest that staff often have, if able, an appointment at the same time every week, because then people are starting to expect. So you've called, you've engaged. Do you ever talk to them about how you're getting there? Does anybody take the bus to do visits? I did visits in the city. There was those, having to manage the, the subway was a bit of a bender. So I've actually talked to people about where to park my car, because I kind of need to know what to expect when I'm getting there. So if you're going to a building on a street, where might you be able to park your car? Maybe, hopefully near the building, right? You might be somewhere else. So somebody talked about going, so in the good old days when we had more time, I actually might go to the neighborhood in advance of my visit to figure out where I'm gonna park. And then some people will say, I never want the client to know what my car looks like, or maybe I want my car nearby. So now we're coming down to some personal preferences about whether you have, there's enough agency cars, whether you're taking an agency car, where you're parking your car, I learned the hard way. I went to a family who had a house and I parked in the driveway and some angry man pulled in behind me and now I was not able to get out of the house. I was not able to get out of the driveway. So there's certain, and then OMH has some guidelines. So years ago when all of this started, OMH put out a manual. This is how you'd be in safety. So if the door is here, you're supposed to park five car spots back here so that you can survey the area. Yeah, that doesn't work. I don't know where those people were doing their training. Um, it's really about using your judgment and your assessment and actually knowing where you're going. So I actually worked with a, a family in White Plains and they, um, they lived on Lexington Avenue. There was never parking there, but the community, and we're gonna talk a little about, about using the community. The community knew pretty quickly that I was there to go visit this kid and the community was worried about this kid and family. So when I would show up, I had same appointment Friday afternoon at three o'clock. When I would show up, there'd be some like guys kind of hanging on the side of the road and they would see me come and they'd be like, those were just the guys in the building because they knew I needed to visit Robert. And they knew that if I had a hard time parking, that, you know, it was, so here's using your community. So what are some other ways to use your community? Can you think of anything? Go ahead. Dogs, yes. Yep. But 
Yep. Or if, you've, if a dog has been there before and now you're expecting the dog's not there, is there an empty bowl, is there an empty chain, are there new dogs, are there people walking dogs? Looking for dogs is a really big thing. I have had to do incident reports because staff were assaulted by dogs on home visits. They were never the big dogs, they were those little ones, those little yippy dogs. Uh, so you're right, so dogs, so if you go to a neighborhood and it's usually busy and you pull up and it's quiet, what do you think about that? Something's going on, or it's too cold, or it's too windy. But just thinking about something being different this time is really important. So I used to think about doing home visits. In, when I worked in the South Bronx, many of the people lived in those very large project complexes. So somebody said to me, you should go at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, because that's when the kids are getting out, and it's busy. There's a lot of people going. But somebody else said to me, you should only go in the morning because it's quiet and you can pay attention. I don't know what the right thing to do was. But so safety training, there's not a list of one's thing. It's really about you, your assessment, what makes sense to you, and just paying attention to all the details. So we talked about parking the car. So do you use the elevator or the stairs? Depends on the building. What would you look at to make that assessment? Who's it? Yep, yep. So sometimes I've had discussions with families about what's the best way to get to your apartment. So it's not about where it's safer, it's what's the best way. Sometimes families will tell you and sometimes not. So if you're, it's three o'clock and they're expecting you and you get there, what's the first thing you do when you get to the door? Call them to let them know you're outside. Sometimes I just listen at the door for a minute because I want to know if there's something going in there and then, so we're going to go, so OMH will recommend, this, they do this on law and order. Here's the door. Knock, knock, knock. I guess they do it on law and order because they don't want somebody to do So OMH will recommend not standing directly in front of the door. But some people will say, I need to see you in the peephole and I can't see you. So everything I say, there's like an opposite of it. So I never know. So Dash asked me to do safety training. I don't know what the right thing is. But these are the things you think about. So where do you stand when you knock on the door? Is the door locked when people come in? Are you, is the person you're expecting answering the door, is it somebody you met? Is it somebody from the family? Is it somebody you've never seen before? And then one of the things that people often forget is I often ask who else is home? Because maybe they're not able to have a confidential conversation. Or I've had people say to me, today's not a good day. And I don't say why we had an appointment. I say thank you very much and go on. So in some of the families that I worked with, the, fam the person that I was seeing was safe, but they lived in a home that they felt was not safe and not confidential. So again, that's a lot about language, it's about communication and listening. If somebody says today is not a good day for a visit, the supervisor is gonna say, you gotta get your visit in, because we got a bill, and some of those things. So I, I, when the supervisors are not in a room, I like to talk about the pressures administration gives to workers getting in, getting your billable was done, but maybe you can't get those people. So what I always say is the staff member should be letting their supervisor, their coworkers know, what's, what's it feel like to do visits in those neighborhoods? So Westchester's only so big. My guess is we've all been to the same buildings, we've all been to the same neighborhoods. So if you know something and you know your coworkers going to that same neighborhood, maybe you can talk about going together. Maybe you can talk about it. I always talk about if I'm going to a neighborhood enough, stop, stopping the local stores and the delis and go buy something to drink so that they see, because people often wonder why I'm there. So who are all the people that might be making visits in a community? Certainly care managers, right? Who else might be making visits? Mobile clinicians. Who else? Peer support. Like, we have a lot more now, but it could be CPS. It could be probation officers. It could, say that again? Act. ACT teams. So we all think we're good helping professionals, but the neighbors don't always know who we are. So what do you do if somebody says, who do you here to see? I used to have this, like this unofficial like security people in the building. Who do you here to see? I can't tell them I'm going to see the Jones because it's confidential. So what do you do? going to see a client, so then they're going to follow you and they know that person now has services. There's really no right answer to this, but it's something to be prepared about. So IDs or no IDs while you're walking around? 
No IDs? Anybody else IDs? Yes? Some agencies say you have to wear your ID. You have to identify yourself. But if I'm going to be confidential with a client and I show up with my ID that says HDSW, so let's talk about dress in the community. What do you wear when you make a home visit? Jeans and sneakers. What? Being ready to run. No. So, so, and there's comfortable and prepared and professional. So during COVID, people got a little lax, right? We're doing home visit. We're you know do, talking on the phone. People wearing yoga pants to work. Now we kind of need to get back about it's business casual, whatever that is. Because if you look too casual, then you don't look respectful to somebody. Um, you know, matching sweatsuits might be nice, but I don't know that it's work attire. So that's a good thing to talk about as a supervisor with your team. What are people wearing? And also, what's fashionable is not always necessarily appropriate. So if you go to the OMH guide, they'll talk about no big earrings, no ponytails, no ties. Maybe. Have you ever heard anybody get pulled by the tie on a home visit? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so that's all about going to the What happens when you go into the house or the building or the apartment? What are the things you need to look for when you're in there? An exit, how else you might get out. Often in apartments, the only way out is a window. Weapons. So what are some weapons? We, what are some weapons anybody's seen in a home visit? Pens? Mm -hmm. Has anybody ever seen a gun on a home visit? So, gigantic ashtrays that are made of rocks. Whew, went right by my head. The family didn't even smoke, but I think they had it as a weapon. A what? A, of say that again? A collection, of a collection of swords. Yep. Swords, ninja stars, anything as a weapon. Chairs, tables. OMH will say, don't meet in the kitchen. There may be knives available. It could be a knife under that couch seat as well. So, again, it goes back to really be paying attention to your area. OMH will say, sit in a firm back chair. Some families don't have those. But I don't always want to sit on the couch that has broken springs that you're like this and you can't get out of. So what do you do if you get to a home visit and it's filthy, it's dirty, it's gross, and you see cockroaches all over? You stand in the corner, but do you have a conversation with the family about why you're standing? Because if you come to my house and stand up, I'm going to feel like you're disrespecting me. Make an excuse. Been driving all day, I need to stand up for a while. What happens if people offer you a, a glass of water? She doesn't want to pee, that's a good one. But again, it, so when we're engaging our clients, if they're offering you something to eat or drink, what does that mean when you say no? And again, there's no answers to these, but these are the things about that make sense to think about. Now, have I, with permit with a discussion with my supervisor about why it might be appropriate to have dinner with a family and again i did work other than care management work i did family engagement work so there was helping families cook and clean so there was a time that i felt it was clinically appropriate to have dinner with a family oh my god the plates were filthy there was no place to sit down there was cockroaches everywhere but i was there to have dinner with a family those are tough calls to make I had some chicken. It was good. Um, but you know, it's, so everything is, is to think about. So you, we've pulled up into the house, we've gone to the house, you're in the house. What do you do if somebody's not home? So leaving a, your business card, cracking the door. When I said I'm so old, there was, we used to have paper that was in triplicate. So you'd write a note, and then there would be a copy to put in the case record. But what happens if the family, you know, if it's a young adult and they live with their parents, maybe the young adult doesn't want the parents to know that you're there. Those are all the confidential stuff and safety stuff are all tied in together. Um, what about if you're on a home visit and it starts to feel uncomfortable? What do you do? How do you get out of an apartment or a house? You fake a call? How do you do that? Oh, I hear my phone vibrating. Mm -hmm. How well? Has anybody ever been on a home visit that you said, oh, no, I got to leave here? Tell me about your situation.
That's a good one. So sometimes I say to people, I'm here, I can stay about 15 minutes, whatever, I'll stay. And then if it feels like it's okay, you can stay a little bit longer or ask them if you can stay longer. But sometimes I start a visit with the idea that I'm only coming for a few minutes. And then if you'll allow me, I can stay a little bit longer. So sometimes your time is you're out. Um, how about, does anybody do any visits after five o'clock or weekends or evenings? Nope. Which, in my world, a system of care providers would be able to visit people nights and weekends. I just, you know, people work, people are out, people have stuff to do during the day. I know agency has lots of rules and supervision and who's going to supervise them, but I always thought that providers should be able to visit people on evenings and weekends. I, you know, clearly it hasn't happened just because I think it should happen, but there are times that maybe visiting somebody on the weekend would be helpful to them. Tell me about first home visits. Do you go by yourself or does somebody go with you? Depends. What does it depend on? If you have a relationship with the family. So if you have a relationship, you've been there before. Remember, I got assaulted and I had a great relationship with the family. Right, it depends, right? Does anybody, go ahead. So the co caseworker, the coworker stayed in the car while the person did. Okay. So in high in hindsight, what well, should have been done different? So, so a lot of this is, it depends, right? It depends on who the client is. It depends on who the staff is. Go ahead. With the super in the building. Yeah, because that's their go-to person if something goes down. So it's an opportunity to be the liaison when something is wrong between the client and the super. But it's also an opportunity to be their like, buddy or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if it's something that they don't like, they can always go to the So let me ask, when you leave, does any, do people have to start their day at the agency or do, can they start their day in the field? So if something happens, so you start your Monday morning at 9.30, you're on a home visit, and your agency doesn't hear from you that day, then what? You work in buddies. You work in buddies. So tell, tell me about a buddy system. Okay. And is your buddy a coworker or a supervisor? Another care manager. So if your buddy's looking for you and they don't know where to find, they can't find you, then what do the what's the buddy do? Supervisor. Go to the supervisor. So the, the serious incident that happened 20 years ago that started all of this is a care manager made a visit and I think took an agency car, I think that's a story. And the, the worker, the, nobody knew where the worker was. So it was about seven or eight o'clock in the evening and the police saw, it was um, a state car, somebody had worked for, for one of the state facilities. 
the police saw a state car parked in a place that shouldn't been, so they backed in, so the police checked the license plate, they found out at what agency it was to, and they called the supervisor and said there's a car located in, you know, like, whatever, 42 Orchard, Orchard Road. The supervisor had no idea what case manager might have been there that day. So because nobody knew where, who the worker was, who the family was that was at that neighborhood, the, the woman had been seriously injured. But nobody knew. The supervisor didn't know who it was until the husband called about 7.30 at night and says, my wife hasn't come home. So if you think about all the times, oh, let me just stop here, let me go here, my day ends. Agencies in the olden days, and that should be interesting to ask what people's safety protocols are now. Mm -hmm. I don't know what agencies do. In the old days, you had to have your schedule in advance, you had to check in with somebody in the morning, check in with somebody in the afternoon, check in with somebody at the end of the day, especially if you were going to some place that may have had some concerning behavior. Sometimes you can get on a visit and say to somebody, I'm going to start this visit at 10 o'clock. Can you call me at 10.15, which is also your way. Some agencies have actually had a code word. So if you call me at 10.15 and I say, I have to go to the dentist today, that means I'm in trouble and figure it out. Um, I think there's been a, a couple serious incidents in Westchester as well. And if you think back to it, it was really when some policies and procedures weren't followed. Um, so Joe's going to we talked about it's not necessarily about our clients, but sometimes it is about our clients. Yeah, yeah. I just want to add to that. It, it's interesting. And Lexi, I appreciate you bringing up what you did as, as far as reentry. We have a staff person who has been with the department many years, and when she started, she was doing transitional case management. And she goes out on a very early case that she's assigned and she's excited because she's new and she goes and she knocks on the door and the person who she's going to see opens the door, lets her in, shuts the door behind her and that's when she realizes that every window in his apartment is covered with aluminum foil. And her first thought was, oh crap, nobody knows I'm here. That's what Kelly's talking about. So when you think it's possible your supervisor is micromanaging you because he wants to know or she wants to know where you are, it's not micromanagement. That's the first step in a safety plan. Where are you going to be? So conflict resolution and de-escalation training. <clears throat> I'm going to hand this back to Kelly in just a second, but first of all, as far as Conflict resolution. How many of you have actually had any training in conflict resolution? Yes. Did you ask? What? If they have training in conflict resolution. I just asked that question. Okay. We're like, look, we're next. We're, we're like, That's yes. Next. Well, the, I did peek over my shoulder, I have okay. to be honest. We're, we're good. Okay. We're on it, so, <laughs> but how many of you have had conflict uh, resolution training? Man, there's oh. like a half a hand over yeah, there. Yeah, there's a half a hand, which means sort of, kind of. But and yeah. it's Lexi who worked in our department. So, oh, of course. I'm going to let you, you want, you want to talk about the conflict resolution training? Do you want to start? This is Mark's slides. Oh, OK. Uh, this is Mark's slide. Yeah. OK. Why don't you talk about training in general, and then we'll talk about I'll OK, more. gotcha. Um, one of the best ways to deal with safety and conflict is to be prepared for it. And that involves being trained to understand not just the conflict that's in front of you, but how do you get to the root of that conflict? Because if you can't understand and identify yourself, I mean, if you think about, if you think about what conflict is, conflict is a disruption, right? Something that is so out of the ordinary, so difficult, so hard to address and deal with, that it creates a major conflict. We're not, you know, we're not talking about your typical dis disagreement here. We're talking about conflict that literally prevents you from either being able to do your job or being able to communicate. De-escalating it essentially means understanding what the root of it is. That's how you get to the point of being able to de-escalate conflict. So we're going to talk in this a little bit about how do we do this? How do you identify what it is? Part of that comes from what you know about the person. 
if you've had experience with them before, if it's someone that you've worked with before, you may have already gone through the process to be able to understand and, identif and identify what may trigger them. They may have told you what may trigger them. You may have stumbled on a trigger without even knowing it. There are so many different things that can occur in a situation like that. Um, from my personal experience, and this was probably one of the saddest situations I ever dealt with, as a family court attorney, um, it was December 22nd, and I was meeting with an eight-year-old client. We were trying to figure out where this eight-year-old was going to go because on January 1st, mom was going to jail for a year. This is three days before Christmas. We're sitting in his house and we're talking at about eight o'clock at night because yes, as Kelly points out, there are times you have to do this in the evening because either there are people you can only see during the day and you need to see them or there are people that you're going to see at night. So we're sitting there at about eight o'clock at night and he and I are talking about you know, family members and what some of the suggestions are and I'm just kind of trying to work with him to, to process all of this. And the people from Renna Center knock on the door, come in and start to take all of their furniture out. Ooh. Needless to say, mom lost it. Who wouldn't? She, I mean, she didn't get violent. I mean, she just broke down and, you know, was sobbing in front of me and in front of my client. You know, but for her, that was her breaking point. So it's not the kind of conflict we're talking about here, but it's clearly the kind of situation where it can occur. <clears throat> so you will not know as you're going into this situation, frequently will not know where the conflict is going to come from. There's another side to this. You could also know where the conflict is going to come from, but in your role and in your work and what you're doing, you're going to have to be able to address that conflict so the person you're working with, the family you're working with, can deal with it and move on. So that's really, when we talk about conflict, part of the role that you all serve, that we all serve, conflict is going to be a part of it, and getting to the root of understanding that conflict is in part how you're gonna get through it. So I will kind of pass this back to Kelly. Um, and if you want to kind of take us through the slides or however you want to handle this, it's up to you. Back to me. It goes to the, to the computer, right? You have point to point at the, the computer. computer and see so, does, so I have, now I have it up here. All right, so oh, okay. it, it, I think in the last two years, the word crisis has come up about five million times. So crisis, conflict, they're kind of all tied in together. So what's the definition of a crisis? Anybody? What's a crisis? I guess none of them are working on the crisis team. They're not working in, in hospital stabilization. So I worked with kids for a long time. The kid once told me that a crisis is when the grown-ups didn't know what to do. And, and that was following a gigantic thing that happened in the house, but the kid didn't think it was a crisis. So it was when the grown-ups didn't know what to do. So you know, working in a crisis program, there's a lot of focus on crisis and hospital prevention and all of that. Sometimes, what Joe was talking about, you have to look at what the root of it is, is about. And often what we know is if people don't have access to money, to food, they feel somebody has disrespected them, what are some of the other situations that you've heard about when you really felt like people were escalating? So clearly people have psychiatric symptoms, that we know, but what are some of the other, other outside stressors that affect people that may cause them to escalate? Domestic violence, alcohol is definitely substance use, alcohol use, so sometimes it's their ability to manage the moods, right? Everybody talks about DBT skills. DBT is really about helping people manage their emotions. So when I'm upset, so we're gonna talk about de-escalation, road rage, right? People can be mild manner, well-meaning, and then there's road rage. So conflict crisis is not necessarily just about psychiatric symptoms, 
For our people, sometimes they don't understand what's going on. Cognitively, they have limitations, right? And if you think about who many of our people are, they live in, on social services, they live in social security, they live with roommates that they didn't choose. They may live in neighborhoods that they don't choose. So the outside forces on many of our people can cause lots and lots of crisis. So a crisis is when somebody doesn't know what to do. I can have a crisis because I can't find my matching sock, it's, it's kind of minimizing a crisis, but if I have to wear those socks because they have some sensory issues and it's gonna set off my whole day, that can be a crisis. Uh, Mark Giuliano would talk about all those people that show up at DCMH on a Friday at, at 4.45 because they haven't gotten something. They haven't got their apartment. They haven't gotten their social security. So during COVID, many staff worked. How many people worked at home or did remote work during COVID? So when you guys were all home, I was sitting in my office at HGSW every single day because our administrative offices were open. So we are representative payee for hundreds of people. We have hundreds of people in housing and clients showed up. They showed up at reception and they were mad, they were angry, they were upset, they were triggered by COVID. They didn't get this, they didn't get, get. and guess who got to deal with every single one of them? That would be me. That's my other job in addition to everything else is I get to handle all the people that are out of control in the, in the reception area. So which is fine, but it's really about who are they there to see, what are they there for, and how can I help them? So often it was about money, and it was about they didn't get their money, they didn't get this, they didn't. So when we go through these slides. All right, hang on. All right, they're not working. They're not so, working. so it goes back. So um, working with people, a crisis can be a challenge. But again, I'm always going to come back to a lot of it is about us. What am I feeling in the situation? So if we are feeling afraid when something escalates, how is it going to be different? Sometimes it's about control. If we think that we're in control of a situation or can be helpful for a situation, that's gonna be different than me in my head going, how am I gonna escape this house? How am I gonna get out? We have to think about our own safety too. But what Joe was saying is if we think about escalating crisis, being aware, looking around, trying to figure out what the next steps are before things start to escalate. So if we go back to that continuum of violence, right? Threats, agitation. So tell me a time when a client started to get agitated and you were worried about where it was going. And tell me how somebody, how you help prevent it from escalating. Go ahead. Snap benefits, DSS, biggest trigger ever, I think. So somebody was, I'm just trying to, so somebody was really frustrated about trying to fill out this tab. You saw it coming. But you also know from in advance that DSS is frustrating. And then online is frustrating. So it was really about somebody not being able to get what they want. But also, so we have somebody who, who comes in who wants to be able to use the computer by themselves, but they don't know how to use the computer. So it's about validating their want to learn it and maybe figure out, but today let me help you. So it all goes, it goes back to relationship and it goes back to words, but all those, those early signs. So what's are some of the early signs that somebody is frustrated? So pulling their hair, words, right? Tone of voice. What are some other things that you might see in somebody who is maybe starting to escalate? Pacing, Pacing mm -hmm. right? Hand wringing. What are some of the psychiatric symptoms that you might hear that might start to be a little bit concerning that we might have to pay attention to? Hearing or seeing things that aren't there. Right. So, you know, the TV told me 
that you were going to say that, yep. right? The we have we have somebody who is the aliens have a lot to do with how miserable his life is. Yep. So I'm not going to tell him that the aliens aren't infecting him. It's, but what can we do about it now? So a lot of it goes back to the language. It goes back about how we talk to Bundy, and it's really about listening. So. So what I say is, so what I've learned in the living room, living room is crisis day respite. It's really about helping pr people prevent the hospital, prevent crisis. What it, my supervision with the staff always is, stop talking so much and just listen. So I would say for many of the people with whom we work, feeling disrespected, feeling invisible, and feeling not heard are probably one of the primary things that I've heard from all the years that I've done this. So systems impact them, right? Family impacts them, trauma, medical issues. So being respected is really the first thing. So calling them in advance, letting them know when something's gonna change. Be on time for your appointment, please. When my doctor's uh, late, I just get really annoyed. So we know that sometimes things impact our ability to be there on time. So being aware, and again, how well we know the client is something different today. If it's the first time you're meeting with somebody, you have to be much more aware. But if it's the second, third, or the fifth year we're meeting with somebody, what, is it different today? What's different about their presentation? Do they look disheveled? Do they look more together than they were before? I, had a, I did a home visit the other day with somebody who I've only ever seen in psychiatric crisis because her water was being poisoned. I've spent years with her talking about having the water tested, where she buy all of those things. None of those was worried. I made a home visit the other day. Masks were off, which was comfortable for her and I. It was, she was lovely. She's teaching piano. She's taking her own piano. She just got a part-time job tutoring. I was baffled at the difference. So what was different that day? I don't know. We talked about her treatment. We talked about her medication. She wouldn't tell me what, whether she was in meds or treatment, but there was something different that day. And, but I was also able to say to her, remember the last time I saw you? What could I have done different to help you understand that I was trying to help you? And she said to me, you were talking too much. So here's me, I do all the supervision in the living room to tell the staff to stop talking too much, and she told me I was talking too much. She said, you weren't listening to what I was really trying to say. I was trying to say that I felt unsafe about the water. So, you know, here's me, I think that I do a really good job, but I had to ask, but I was able to ask her in a time when she wasn't in crisis about what would have been helpful for me to do different. So again, that's your relationship with the client. Sometimes you're gonna know that you need to listen, you need to talk quieter. So we're gonna go through some of these, these slides. So these are, this is a PowerPoint that was put together by Mark Giuliano related to OMH training and Mark's fabulous training. If you haven't seen Mark's training, you should go to Mark's training. Um, so here's some of the 10 rules about promoting safety. So we've talked about respect, offering space. So we talked about where you sit in a home visit. So I'm just ask Destin. So if I'm talking to Desh somewhere and I see her start to be agitated, where should I stand or where should I be? This close? So this is a good judge because if I'm gonna punch Desh, I might feel I'm safe, but I'm coming in like this. So if somebody's starting to agitate and there's the ability to give space, just give them space. Because people often feel crowded, they feel uncomfortable, you're in this, you know, so often people say we're in your space, but if you're in an office, how do you do that? So when I started working with kids, I was the social worker, I never sat in an office, I didn't do that kind of work. So I would go to the therapist's office with them or I'd go to the schools and the, th the therapist would say, I'm going to have my office, my chair near the door so I can escape if I need to. And I'd say, I wanna be on the other side of the desk and let the kid be able to get out the door. So when you think about safety, are you trying to get yourself to have an escape? Sometimes you want them to be able to have an escape. If they want to leave this situation and you're standing in front of the door because it feels safer for you, you might want them to be able to leave. So the, the broadest view you have allows you to be safe, but also somebody else to be safe. But you're still engaging them. You don't want to be way over here because now I look like I'm afraid of Dash. Some days. <laughs> um, communication, we're going to talk a lot about that. Diffusing using verbal skills, and we'll get to that. And using a safety plan. So. 
if you've had conflicts with people in the past, you might talk to them about, remember last time when you were really mad at me, what could we have done differently? And again, it's really about your relationship with clients. You can't do that with everybody, but if they have a therapist or they're in a housing program, you might be able to help them talk to those providers or talk with those providers about what works for them. So we have somebody who lives in our residential who is lovely, we have no conflict in the residential. Soon as he goes to pros, he's got all sorts of conflict. I don't know what the difference is. He says that they don't, they don't listen to me there. I, I don't know, but we need to learn from each other about what works. Um, and again, using your own judgment. So it's a big, it's trusting your gut. Click. <gasps> it's a it worked, it worked. <laughs> ah. All right, so Joe, so help me. So, so these are just some steps. So we're always assessing, right? Yep. Who, when, where, what's different. Um, always ask if you can be helpful. So when those people show up in the reception area, yelling and screaming because it's the 27th and they should think they should get their social security that's not gonna come. Sometimes I say to them, how can I be helpful? You can, I just want my money now. Because they know I can't give them the money. So it's a lot about asking. So we're gonna get to some, some words, some language that we use. It's, we're gonna talk about how we respond and we're gonna evaluate what's going on every single minute. Go ahead, Joe. And again, these are, oh, two times in a row. Um, I may quit right now. Exactly. <laughs> so I think me. we can go to the, with the next slide, because we talked, we're on it. It only took us an hour and a half. <laughs> All right, so what are some of the situational factors? So we've talked about some of these. Why don't you go on to the next slide, Joe? Because now I'm freaking out that we don't have enough time. So, well, we're sorry. so look. Overcrowding, staff are not accessible. That's the one that I have at the agencies all the time. I called my worker, they didn't respond. They must be working at home. They don't care about COVID. They're keeping themselves safe. I have to be out here. I have to go sit at DSS. The security guy is there. And then they're pointing that gun at me to take my temperature. Taking people's temperatures for me in the last two years has been one of the biggest triggers for people because they feel like you're not safe. So. We have to because it's the regulations. I always take my temperature first and show them that I don't have a temperature and show them or offer that on their, on their arm. But I've had more conversations about people not feeling safe about this, the, the, the trigger to their head. Um, the person doesn't feel safe. So how, how might somebody not feel safe? Certainly if they're domestic violence, if they're being threatened, what are some other ways they don't feel safe? Don't have enough food, right? Don't know when my next money's coming. I live in the shelter. Losing housing. If more people talk about not feeling physically safe in the shelter, that they would rather sleep on the streets. And I don't have a lot to do. I don't know how to do that. Um, so again, the living room is not a, a drop-in center, but when people feel so unsafe in the shelters that they'd rather be on the street, sometimes we can help with that. It's a safe place to come to relax. Sometimes people just come to sleep during the day because they've been up all night at the shelter. Um, people don't feel safe when, when you go to social services and there's a, a cop there. Or, you know, if there's police there, it makes people feel unsafe. It's a little weird. It makes the workers feel safe, but not the clients that go there. And that's a social service? So that, that lady that put it, mm-hmm. But, and that's good to, oh, how does it feel to you? Imagine, so that lady that put the key down her bra, when she had to go to the medicine, she refused, so she could not go to family court. Exactly. 
it, it, she would not take the key off, so they would not let her into family court. So I had to get a special thing from the judge to have her hand searched. They didn't want to do that because it, it held up the line. She and I understood why she needed that key with her. She wasn't even in her house, but she needed that key with her. So that's sometimes understanding. So she, you know, the 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 court officer said she had a temper tantrum. She didn't have a temper tantrum. She was in crisis. So the court officers went to the judge and said she just had a big old temper tantrum, and I was able to explain it to the judge. So sometimes that's our relationship with people, which helps de-escalate those. Um, inexperienced or overburdened staff. So tell me why that's up here. Why is that related to conflict resolution and de-escalation? You don't have the patience. You don't have the patience, yep. What else? They don't have the experience. Don't have the experience, don't have the knowledge. So my staff, they call me the, the fixer. I've just been around a long time. I know a lot of people. So if some, I'm gonna call Dash, I'm gonna call the county, I'm gonna, like it's just, I just know who to call. I, you know, I've grown up in the system. I, you know, I've worked in Westchester County for almost 30 years. So you get to know people. So all the people that were lying staff with me are all supervisors somewhere. So I can make one call. It's okay, let me do that. Because people don't have the experience. They don't have the patience. They don't have the understanding. And working with people with psychiatric symptoms is really hard. And then you add in substance use, justice system. It's really, really hard. People are very complex. And we also have our own issues. So if we come to this, and one of the staff member I used to work with had a long history of being a victim of domestic violence. She would be on a home visit, and there would be a loud noise, and she would have that startle surprise reaction. And then the family would have a reaction to her re having a reaction. And what the outcome was, she realized that she couldn't be doing work that was so unpredictable. There was nothing wrong with her work. It just, it was too upsetting for her. So I've had lots of people who start their career and maybe doing home visits and working, isn't for you and it's really, really okay to say this isn't for you. But always being kind of aware of your own stuff. Lack of self-determination. That one I was, uh, so what is, is that the client's lack of self-determination you think? Mm -hmm. It's gotta be. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's what you were talking about before when you're taking away a person's ability to make their own decisions, you are, as you were pointing out, dehumanizing them. Yep. And of all of these things that are key problems, not only is that a serious one, that's probably the hardest to come back from. Yep. And, and no inclusion in the planning. So I hear staff all the time saying, well, I gave the, their, I, the goal I have for them is. That is not their goal. So when we talk about person-centered language, all that. So we have people come into residential all the time and they want to work. And you hear the therapist, everybody, they can't work. Well, maybe they can't work today, but they can work on pre-vocational stuff. So if you tell me you want to work, I had somebody, a kid who wanted to be an astronaut. We spent a lot of time talking about what you need to do to be an astronaut. And really what he wanted to do is he liked science. But it took years to kind of get that. So, and he didn't read really well. So probably not going to college, but was able to work in something for him that felt like it was enough that he was working towards an astronaut. So, it, you know, it's a language. Somebody gives this big lofty goal, and we're like, hey, that's not happening. You've already ruined your relationship with them. So it goes back to the listening. So why did he want to be an astronaut? He wanted to feel important. Yeah, until you get assaulted on a home visit. And in all of my career of working with people with psychiatric diagnosis, the thing I hate the most is when I hear, oh, they're just borderline. They're just a borderline. So. When I started learning about trauma, I heard that rephrased, and I heard that borderline personality disorder is about trauma of relationship. And it reframed everything for me. So often people who have a borderline personality diagnosis, it's really about some early relationships and how you get along with people and all those DBT skills that everybody talks about. It really reframed it for me. So as soon as I, and I had one woman said to me, well, New York Hospital says I am the most borderline person they ever met. I don't know if she should be proud of that, 
But it was really, for me, it was about helping her ha have the ability to get along with people. So diagnosis, we haven't really talked a lot about diagnosis today because whatever we're doing here is not about their diagnosis. It's about what people are presenting at that moment. Um, all right, why don't we go on? So what are some of the risk factors? So, uh, come on, Joe, it worked before. Uh, okay, you can keep going, we've done some of this already. I don't talk in the same order that Mark does this presentation. So if somebody's having a crisis, so we've talked about this. So there's symptoms and diagnosis, right? We could, you could go to full day trainings, weekday trainings about what somebody with the diagnosis of schizophrenia looks like, what some symptoms need to be. Now you're going too fast, Joe, go I'm back. Sorry. <laughs> now that it works, I'm just. You're all willy You're gonna play. Exactly. I was looking for something that said diagnosis. So, sim so symptoms. So we talked about history of violence, right? We talked some about substance use. So now that, you know, the catchphrase, are, when you're around as long as like Desh and Joe and I have been, all the popular phrases hey. change. So now it's trauma-informed and trials. So now co-occurring is a thing. So tell me what co-occurring disorders are, what, what the work about being co-occurring informed is. Go ahead. So that interplay between mental health and substance use. So the fantasy in the world is that staff are not trained and agencies are not one or the other. So in the olden days when we all started, somebody would show up to a clinic and they go, oh no, you're a substance user, go over to that place. And you would get to a substance use facility and they go, oh, you have bipolar disorder, go over there. So you either have two people not working on the same goals or issues not being addressed. So our hope now is that people are co-occurring informed. Agencies are doing that work being co-occurring informed. We do have those state agencies, Office of Mental Health, so that don't always play nice together, but our job is to understand psychiatric symptoms and substance use. And then often you had psychiatric symptoms, substance use, trauma history, justice involved. That makes people very complicated. So our risk factors, so your family background, your social factors, your age and gender and your neurobiological fact. Tell me about neurobiological. What would be a risk factor for crisis related to neurobiological and age and gender? Talk about that corner over there. Anybody? Anybody ever see anybody with low blood sugar or high blood sugar? Yeah. What would that look like? Sometimes. Right? People can be agitated, their cognition can be off. As people get more aged, you can have a, tr a urinary tract infection that looks like you're psychotic or have dementia. That baffled me when I worked in an adult care facility. I didn't know that. But if you think, so there often is medical stuff that makes people present like they're having psychiatric symptoms. It doesn't matter what it is, we're dealing with what the crisis is at the moment. So the police have that phrase, you hear it all over law and order, um, emotionally disturbed person. I don't work in the justice system, but so in the police world, emotionally disturbed person could be anybody. It could be somebody who is having psychosis. It could be somebody who is high. It also could be somebody who has had a domestic violence incident and is yelling and screaming. So the police need to pretty quickly figure out which, which these are. And age and gender. So is somebody more at risk of being violent or escalating if they're younger? Research talks, go ahead. Are you more at risk for somebody? So sometimes younger people don't have the skills yet, right? Sometimes older people have more experience. So don't underestimate one of those old ladies who cannot escalate and be violent as well. I worked in an adult home. It was the little old ladies who were much more, much more unable to manage their moods who escalated much quicker. So don't underestimate, it's everybody. Go ahead, Joe. So what are the factors that help these things? So we certainly know medication and treatment. And again, our work with people is helping them get proper treatment and proper medication, but not everybody wants that, right? So how do you have, do you have discussions about, I don't like my meds, nobody can take me take meds, you know, that's a lot of the work we do, and that's a whole other training about motivational interviewing and brief action planning. I could keep Dash busy with trainings all day long. <laughs> um, 
Whether people take medication as prescribed, that's a big deal. We have somebody who's always in crisis because they won't take their medication as, as prescribed. It's not helpful if it's not the way the doctor says. Um, and so in the last five, 10 years, people being involved with peers. So does a person have a history of violence? I get it. Um, and is there evidence of violence? So if you're walking into a home visit and things, often our home visits are, people are in disarray, right? But it doesn't look like there's broken stuff. Does it look like there's been a scuffle? Does it look like, so that's one of the first things you're, if you're walking into something. So sometimes when I walk out into the reception area, somebody's taken all of our pamphlets and thrown them. Not the most violent incident, but it also tells me that somebody's been frustrated. Um, is there a weapon? And again, we talked about what the five million, you know, that heavy ashtray could be a weapon. Um, all right, so is the person intoxicated? So what we know, and this could be a whole day training, is people under the influence of alcohol or substance are um, normally, what does that say? Might normally suppress violence. So, so people who are not necessarily violent under the influence of alcohol or drugs may have lower frustration tolerance and more increase of violence. And there's some statistic, which I don't know, is people in jail, 90% of people have had alcohol before their crime? Does that sound like a good statistic? 85% of the people who are incarcerated have a history of substance use. Okay, so 85% of people incarcerated have some history of substance use. That's pretty significant. And how many of those people do you think have trauma histories as well? Same? It's, yeah, I would imagine that, you know, for another training, maybe we talk about that continuum. Yep, yep. Ooh, look. I'm going. Got a point in it there. here. I feel less needed. <laughs> you can click if you want. All right, so we're just going to get this set. So we've talked about this. So we've talked about, see, now it's not working, Joe. Click. Now you need it. Hmm? Now you need it. I can't bend around the corner. Okay. So we are going to the intervening in a crisis. Is that where you want me to go? Yeah, I think one more slide. So communicate, there we go. So communicate, so you can go to the next slide. So communication is a key, right? So one of the things that's not in this, there's a question that I learned in safety training. So if a client is increasingly agitated, I have asked people, are you mad at me? So the answer can be yes, no, or they're not sure. So are you mad at me? What do you think the most concerning answer is? Yes, yes, no, or unsure? Yes, or unsure? Which do you think? So why do you think yes is the most concerning answer? Right, so you know, you know they're the target. Yeah, it brings a sense of immediacy. It, right, a sense of immediacy, but sometimes unsure is a little more concerning because if you're mad at me, I can try and figure out what that is to see what I could do. If the answer is no, let's figure out what I can do. But if somebody's not sure what they're mad about, that's concerning because sometimes they don't know how you can be helpful and I don't know how to help for. Um, and it's also all these times, it's like, how am I feeling right now? Go to the next one, Joe. So, <laughs> So Mark talks about being highly skilled and effective communication to de-escalate a person in crisis. Well, some of that is just, so if you've ever parented a toddler, you do lots of de-escalation. And not to minimize de-escalating people with serious symptoms, but sometimes the skills are the same when you're working with kids, that you have to figure out what's needed, what's going to prevent them, what are they presenting, and how can you be helpful to them. Go on to the next one. So there's some skills, and we could do motivational interviewing, we could do all of these. So let's look at some of these communication skills. So what does it mean to be to reflect or to mirror? Tell me, can somebody give me an example of mirroring what that might, what some of these might be? Emotional labeling, paraphrasing. Anybody give me some examples of some statements that might be helpful when somebody's de-escalating? All of them are tools of validation. Right. Every single one of them. So I hear step. you saying, I want to be helpful. Um, it looks like you're angry. 
And that also gives the opportunity for somebody to say, no, I'm not angry. No, I'm not mad. Well, then tell me, and often what we know is our clients also don't have, often have a fund of those emotional words. So we have a, you know, there's that emotion wheel, which we should put in here. Like sometimes people only know mad, but maybe mad is frustrated. Maybe mad is hungry. Maybe mad is disappointed. So often people have a hard time identifying what it is, but I might say to somebody, you look like you're mad, or are you mad? Are you upset? Go ahead. I'm just venting. Right. Right. So that goes back to how we're feeling. So if somebody's raising their voice, are they raising their voice around me or are they raising their voice at me? So sometimes we need to check in. Are you mad at me? What can I do? But it's also figuring out why. So people are often trickled by raised voices, and an, well, you're getting an attitude with me. How many times you, have I heard workers say, they had an attitude with me? It's never about us. They were frustrated, they were upset, they were not feeling heard. It really always goes back to what the client's presenting. Do I think that sometimes somebody has an attitude? In my heart, yes, but as a worker, my son had an attitude. My son was upset and hungry and tired. But those are two different things. So let's go to some of the, the examples. So we'll go to one of the next pages here. So having good communication, and I, we do need to do a, a motivational interviewing something, Okay, I think is part of your thing. So well, one of the things we're trying to do is just engage people. But what I know about people in crisis is sometimes people in crisis, they have so many things going through their thoughts in their head, right? that sometimes we just need to be quiet. So if we bombard them with questions, or we ask them too many things, or we're trying to fix things that they don't want fixed, sometimes it's okay just to be quiet for a few minutes. And I find that early on, I say, do you need a few minutes? I'm gonna give you a few minutes to just breathe, to think. I'm not telling somebody to breathe, because in nowhere in the world of calm down, if you tell somebody to calm down, do they ever calm down, right? They, you know, calm down. Okay, that's not going to work. Be quiet. That's not going to work. Sometimes you just need people. So what they, what they also know about crisis, people can't sustain this for a really long time. So sometimes you get past that and then you can do the work. You can do the talking. So what you're trying to do is de-escalation, but at the same time you're trying to gain knowledge. What's going on with them? What do they need help with? And sometimes they do just need to be vent, to vent so that they're feeling heard. And I think that's the difference. When somebody says, I'm trying to vent, I might say to them, what are you trying to tell me? Or what do I need to hear? Or what are the important things you're trying to let me know? But not to clarify. So I'm not gonna say, you must be really mad at DSS because they cut off your benefits. I might say, are you feeling some kind of way about social services? It's really allowing them to tell you, don't tell them what, they, what you think they're going on. And some of the research talks about not saying, I know how you feel. You don't know how I feel. Your life is not like mine. You can have the same situation, but you don't know how I, how I feel. So I walked at what, the first person who came into our crisis program, she knocked on the door, she came in, she handed me a wrap plan. What's a, what's a wrap plan? Anybody know what a wrap plan is? A wellness recovery action plan. And it's something you do with people before a crisis so that we can be helpful for them during a crisis. So we're putting rep plans on our, on our list also. Um, so this woman came in with her plan that she'd done with the therapist about how to be helpful to her, or how not to escalate, and she said to me, don't tell me everything's gonna be okay because you don't know that it is. And how many times does somebody in the helping profession say, oh, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. You don't know that it's gonna be fine. So people have to take that. So if you think about all the words that are not helpful for people, my guess is we say those. It'll be fine, we'll make some calls next week. People need an immediate something. So what I might say to somebody is let's make a plan for next steps. We might not be able to solve that today, but let, what are the steps? What can we do today and what can we do in the future? So somebody's really looking at your intentions. Are you really trying to help them or are you just trying to shut them up and get them out? Are you trying to run away? Are you trying to, so we're really looking for, and again, it goes back to the engaging and are people feeling like they're heard. 
and making informed decisions. You can say to them, it is four o'clock on a Friday. We can try and call social services, but I'm not sure we're gonna get somebody. So what are the next steps? What can we do today? So that's somebody who is hearing that you're frustrated. They're hearing that you understand what their needs are, and maybe you're reminding them that they're probably not gonna get anything on Friday at five o'clock. So if we're thinking about words and your tone of voice and your body language, what's the most important thing in any kind of crisis escalating anything? What do you think the most in words, the tone of your voice, your body language, what's the most important? Your body language. So tell me a little bit about body language. Why would that be important? Right, so you don't look threatening because if, think about the times when you have a lot going on in your head, you might not be hearing what I'm saying, you might not be understanding what I'm saying, but you can look at me. So why don't you do the, the next slide, Joe? So clear, 55% is body language. So one of the kids, this is, again, I worked with kids for a long time. So his description of communication, he's like, my, I don't believe that my mom loves me. I said, your mom says she loves you all the time. Yeah, but she says it like this, I love you. So like your tone, like those are very important things. And when mama's standing like this going, okay, I love you. I don't know that she, he really felt that. So tone of voice, but look how little the words are. So it's about what people are seeing. So hands in your pockets or out of your pockets? Now, uh, why is that? Say again. You might be trying to hide something, right? You might have your own weapon. But sometimes people are threatened by your hand. So again, it depends is the answer to a lot of things. So I try and just have my hands down here. Some people need your hands out here so they can see you don't have anything in your palms. So a lot of it, it comes down to your gut and what's going on, how well you know the person. But if you, so watch movies and watch police officers. You know, they, they often stand with a stance, right? So nobody's going to knock them over. But with their hands like that, it can't be like unnatural. No hands in the pocket. This is what? This is threatening, right? And dismissive. And dismissive. Yeah. And then, so eye contact or no eye contact? Let's talk about that. Eye Before contact. Before we do that, though, Kelly, yep. I just want to interrupt you. You also need to look at this kind of as a hierarchy. Yes. Because if you can't do that right, and you can't do that right, you're not going to get to the words. The words aren't going to mean anything. So it's not just percentages. It's also the hierarchy. And again, so body language might be, so if somebody is sitting down, where should you be? Standing over them? No. Maybe stand, so they'll say equal eye contact, but if I'm not feeling safe, I don't know that I want to sit down. Maybe I need to be closer to the door. So it depends. But if, if Desh is in a conflict and I'm standing over her like this, what is this, this is the power and control, right? Mm -hmm. So I might sit down, like if Joe wasn't there, I might sit down a couple seats away. Mm -hmm. So I'm not right next to her, but it's also I'm trying to, and it's, you know, the tone of your voice and lowering your voice. So, you know, they always talk about if somebody's yelling, bring your voice down. It works. It's an amazing thing because they have to lower the voice to hear what you're saying if they want to hear what they're saying. Um, Let's see, let's do the, the next one. So effective communication, one of the important things is to not rush. So when people are in crisis, so in general, adult learning says, what I say isn't necessarily what you hear and it's not what you do, right? How many times have we said to our children or our parents or our clients, said something and then they do something totally different? When you're in crisis, people are listening to less of what you're saying or understanding and cognitively understanding less. So don't rush through things. I come from upstate New York, I talk really fast. I have caffeine, I talk really fast. I have to pay attention and be mindful what I'm saying, how much I'm saying, and how complex are the things I'm saying. If I say four steps, let's go over here, we'll make a call, we'll do this, and then we'll, that's too many things. Um, I raised a child with, you know, with, with ADHD, and he would say to me, you're telling me too many things. I learned that from a seven-year-old. Because when I said, go in your room, do this and this, he would go in his room and he'd do this. Because he didn't remember what happened afterwards. So I was able to take that. So when people are in crisis, they're not listening. They're upset. So one thing at a time, don't rush. Um, and a majority of your com conversation, communication is nonverbal. Do the next, Joe. 
I like telling John what to do also. So we talk tone of voice, speaking, eye contact. Speaking, getting lying. <laughs> so tell me about eye contact. Make eye contact, don't make eye contact. So what would be some of those that depends? Mm -hmm. Play a big role in that, and I think start with stances. Mm -hmm. If your eye contact is going to challenge the person and provoke them, yep. or if you perceive as that, then it's submissive, slow boy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's a power struggle, right? So as much as I think that I have trained all of my staff on this, we had a staff, a male, and I'm going to say male because it matters, a male staff member and a male client, they got into a pissing contest. I don't know what that was, but certainly the staff should have done something different. So another staff, you know, there was something that was escalating, and it was really about the staff member needed to do something different because this person's perception, the client's perception of what they were saying was not going well. And what happened is then the client, or the client who never remembers the staff member's name called him baby boy. Okay, whatever, isn't in my, whatever. Well, that set off my staff member. He needs to know my name. Okay. I, it, you know, as a supervisor, I was a little disappointed. But what happened is then he kept saying, you need to say my name. And he kept saying, baby boy, baby boy. And it, you got what? And, and, then, and then the staff member's closer. And another staff member, can you stand up for a minute? Yeah. That's really tall. Staff member's really short. And they're this close, and they're having this stare off. And another staff member, a social work intern, comes in and said, Back up, dude, because the staff member got so caught up in whatever this was. So then the staff member's like, well, you know, if it got into a fight, it shouldn't have gotten there. When he called you baby boy from the other room, what could you have done differently? So in hindsight, the staff knew what, but the staff, it was about them. They got caught up in challenging, and I've been in jail, and I know what it's like, and I got to defend. You are a staff member. So again, as a supervisor, as a staff member, I've spent more time talking to staff in incidents, because I have to oversee incident reporting, when the staff member should have done something different. It's because the staff member wasn't aware of their own issues. They were, the staff members were being triggered, as they said, but it's not about us, which is really hard. So you, excuse my language, I'm gonna curse. Can I curse, is that okay? Curse. I, I, somebody calls me a fat bitch. Okay, like, I, I know what your intention is, but I'm not going to go, yo. Question? Well, first of all, just a comment. If somebody called me a fat bitch, which they have, I'm more offended by the fact that they call me a fat bitch. Okay. Because I'm not going to say that there should be an, another additional circle to this. That's like facial grimacing. Yes. You, people are very into, like, rolling your eyes. Yep. Doing that. Yep. You know, especially if you have a mask on. Right. So let's add masks into all of this. So, you know, again, it's masks, it's social distancing. So people are upset, they throw off their masks, they're, they're spitting, and their staff members are like, oh, get the, you know, spray in the, you're not helping. But that's about the staff members. So all of this really has a lot to do with us and our own reaction. So we need to practice things a lot. So Joe said before, you're not gonna have to use this a lot. But then it doesn't, it's kind of counterintuitive. So, you know, so that person who called him baby boy, I've had, you know, he's not on medication, often psychotic, but we know that now. We didn't know that before. So his perceptions of things are a little bit different. So we say it, we write it, we have him read it to see if you understand, all those things we do. But he was mad at one, and he called me baby girl. And I said my, myself, I'm like, a baby girl. Like, I was so excited that, like, for him, he didn't remember my name, but he was recognizing me as something. But I understood that. So, you know, it, it, a lot of this has to do with our reaction. So if I'm afraid every single day I'm going to get assaulted, I need to be working on all these things. So I have a social work intern, and I knew her before she came to her, and she makes those eyes. She rolls her eye long before she came to us, and she said, managing my face is going to be one of my biggest issues. So now she's been doing two years of social work internship with a mask on. She's like, I'm going to have to like worry about my lips now, because sometimes she's like, you know, and I, I know her to know that under she's having some reactions underneath her mask, but once those masks are off, your facial, you are all out there. And it's also, so if a client doesn't have their mask on and you want them to put it on, then you're already having the power struggle. So COVID and the masks and, and all of that, the, the racial stuff, the, the microaggressions, like this is complicated work. 
All of that comes before you meet with the client for the first time. Let's go to the next one. Body language, facial expression, arm crossing, tone of voice, personal, keep going, Joe. I talk without the slides. Uh, defensive posture, what's a defensive posture? Arms crossed. So when you sit in a chair, I had a staff member said, well, I'm, I'm looking like I'm casual. Staff member's like, okay, but you're not being respectful. You wouldn't do that if you were sitting with, with your teacher. So, you know, it's always about being respectful also. Sitting behind the desk, the dreaded desk. So back to safety. So when you're transporting clients, where do they sit in the car? Back seat, back seat. Mm, nobody, back seat. How about teenagers, where do they sit? Trunk. <laughs> <laughs> so OMH will say, if I'm the driver, the client should sit back there. Because if you don't want them here, I want them next to me in the front seat so I can see them. So, and when you work with teenagers, I am not in, in engaging a teenager if I'm telling them to sit in the back seat. It's a struggle to get the seat belt on. But again, it's so, you know, where you are, your proximity, where you sit, agencies will say they have to sit in the back seat, but do you want to get in that power struggle with somebody? So I've said to them, DMV says you're safe from the back seat, and sometimes that works, but then you have the power struggles about the seat belts, right? Anyways, so next one, Joe. We're trying. All right, so these are, we've talked about all this. So a person in crisis might be frightened, right? But people have a hard time saying, I'm scared. That's, you know, it shows that you're weak if you say you're scared. They might feel ignored, misunderstood, frustrated, hopeless, invisible. I have learned that word a lot from our crisis program, that people feel like they're invisible. When I go to DSS, and I, I feel like I'm bashing DSS, but we just talk about DSS. You know, I'm, I'm a number, I'm sitting there, I'm invisible. I call my insurance company, and I have to wait online. They don't know who I am, they don't know my name. When I go to see, and then with telehealth, more people, my clients that I've seen in our programs have not liked and have not enjoyed telehealth. Although the world talks about telehealth being a fabulous thing. I don't know for the population who I work with if it's been a good thing. Because they don't like Zoom. They don't like the telephone call. They, they, I'm not important enough to do my clinical work. They know COVID, they know precautions, but they felt like the agency should have been done something so that they could be seen in person. You know, and it's just part of the, the whole world that we live in. And then clinicians say, I want to, you know, protect my own COVID protect. So we're going to do telehealth. And I'm just so sick of talking about COVID and telehealth. Um, often people are overwhelmed. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, we can do the next one. We've talked about all this emotional stress. Um, keep going. Keep going. So Mark has a picture of the brain. So there's the front of the brain, which is about your reasoning and your thinking. Um, so there's the flight or fight, flight or fight response. Tell me a little bit about that. What does that mean? There's another one, fight, flight, and what's the third one? Freeze. So when we talk about workers in situations, so when we go back to baby boy, my staff member was in fight mode. He was going to protect his honor at any cost. That's not the mode that he should have been in. I've also had staff who've run the other way. So when we talked before about taking two people on a home visit, so I used to supervise an ACT team. You know, ACT team goes everywhere. So I, we were also the landlord in the building. So ACT needed to go see a client. The police were there. They were gonna try and escort him to the hospital, but I had the keys. So my job was to open the door. Now the client was, we're standing on the road, there's some steps to go up and the client was on the porch. So the police said to the ACT team, can you help? So ACT had sent two people. The nurse who was about 70 years old was walking up those stairs towards the agitated client. And the other staff member was running up the street. And I'm just going, mm. so which was the right thing or what was the wrong, what should it, you know, somebody's up on a porch and they're agitated and cursing and making threats. What should have happened? Stop and engage them verbally instead of approaching them or running. Right, not running up the stairs toward them? Probably not smart. And not running up the block. 
So we spent weeks and weeks and weeks with these two staff members, like in counseling, because she said, you were there, supposed to be there to help me, and you weren't there to help me. And he's like, but you were stupid. You want to, so sometimes because you're sending two people together, it doesn't mean you have the same reactions and the same ideas. Um, I think I'm going to jump to the scenarios and we can kind of weave yep. a little of this in. But yep. We're... Yes. Maybe I won't because um, there's no jumping. Yeah, there's no jumping. Do... I'm sorry, go, ba go back one. Go back to that one. So, so here's the timeline. So, and we talked about this. Like, people don't stay escalated for a really, really long time. So, you have a high level of emotions, and over time, now sometimes it's five minutes and sometimes it's 30 minutes, but people can't stay at this for a really long time. So, over time, when people hopefully, unless it's substance related, people can be more rational over time. So, if we can stick with people, through those hard times, then you're working, again, you're back to your communication, your relationship. Go ahead. Jeff. As long as there's no new triggers coming into the situation. Right. So and when, exactly. Yeah, so depends on where the city, who else is there. So you might have to have this start to be managed and a family member walks in, somebody they're mad at walks in, your supervisor, you know, so it's always when you're in the middle of this looking what's going on. Because sometimes you might want to say to your supervisor, coworker, come in and help me a little. And sometimes you might say, stay away. So again, there's a lot to manage when things were going on. That was a good point, Joe. So in the crisis, how much time do you last? It depends. It depends. It depends on what it is, I think. And it also depends on how it's addressed. I mean, we've, we've all heard the story of the many, many hours of standoff with the police of someone who's barricaded themselves in their house. I think from a clinical perspective, we all collectively would probably handle it differently, and that's what we're trying to avoid. Yep, and go on to the next one. Uh, we've kind of done this yeah. understanding so this is a good connect with somebody it's about you know uh, your affect your listening and your mirror matching so if they're starting to de-escalate you start to de-escalate it's not time to re-trigger them it's not time to start again um, go, keep going a couple slides in here so let's look at some of the scenarios and again this is the answer is it depends a lot um, uh, uh, uh. We've done we've done all this stuff. I think reflecting. Don't tell somebody to calm down. Um, there's something called the 80/20 rule. Does anybody know what that is? Listen 80% of the time and talk 20% of the time. Um, sometimes open-ended questions are the best, and sometimes you want yes or no questions. Um, Let me see if I can switch it from in here. Let's see. I think my battery just died again. <laughs> so if you're trying to engage somebody in a conversation and you're asking open-ended questions, which is what we all learn, right? Ask them, but sometimes they need yes or no questions. Can I help you? Yes or no. Do you feel safe now? Yes or no. Can we go outside? Yes or no. Sometimes we want yes or no questions to kind of move along our assessments. Um, some some empathetic things that's a lot to deal with and you could just you look like you're overwhelmed that's a lot to deal with um, that's really confusing when that happens it's hard to know what to do right now it feels like there's no hope but um, if an individual isn't responding that's when you're asking yes or no questions or what happened what happened before that um, where are you I'm where you were talking about the 80 20 rule okay open-ended questions, done all this stuff. et cetera. All right, so let's do some exercises. Okay. So we're going to, somebody says, I just hate my life and it seems like everything's just falling apart. So if you're sitting with somebody at the kitchen table and they say that. I mean, just let it go. Yeah. That's one. If somebody's standing over you yelling and screaming, I just hate my life, everything's falling apart. Tell me what some things you might do. Mm hmm Can you tell, I like, can you tell me more? Tell me more, or what's that about, or, yeah, any, any of those are good. You're really trying to get some clarification, because if you don't have clarification, you can't figure out what they want, right? What else? 
Help me understand, that's a good one. Help me understand what's going on, how it can be helpful, what we can do next. Um, my wife, I know what she's done. She's installed an electronic tracking device in my arm to track my every move. I've seen people she's hired, they're following me. They're here all over the, they're all over the time. And that's somebody who's clearly agitated. What will some responses might be? Mm -hmm. Are you safe now is a good question. What else? Why do you think she did that? Have you talked to her about it? What do you want the outcome to be? Um, how can I help you? Right. Is there anything I can be helpful with that? Because you're not going to take out the tracking device. Uh, we have somebody who, who calls our crisis program almost every day who says that the FBI is following her and they want her to move. We, this has been years of this. We are not changing that fixed illusion, but when she goes outside, she feels unsafe because she feels like she's going to get picked up by the FBI. So one of the staff members did a brilliant thing. The staff member said, do you trust our agency? And she said, yes. So she gave two business cards and she said, you have those business cards and if the FBI stops you, you tell them you're with us. That, that solved it. She was able to go out because she felt like she was safe. I, clinically, I don't know if it's the best answer, but we were not changing that fixed illusion and she was actually in her house for a really long time because she was afraid of the FBI. Now she's able to go out of her house because she's got my business card in her pocket. Who knew? Who knew my business card had that much power? But sometimes we try and fix things in some non-conventional ways. We're not gonna change that he thinks his wife has a tracking in his arm. So how can I help you? How can you feel safe? What can we do? Can we make a plan? Those are really good scenarios and we're dark. All right, every time I watch TV, the people in the commercial tell me that I should go hurt myself or somebody else. Why won't they stop? <coughs> Thoughts? Can't see up there. Come on. Right, you're assessing for right now, right? Yep. And if they say no, then what? Yeah, it's really frustrating. I'm, you know, there's a there's a piece about just kind of walking people through what the steps are now. But if they say now, then you're reassessing for, are they safe, are you safe? How can we make them feel safe? Is the TV on? Um, you know, there's some immediate things to do, but that's good trying to figure out if it's happening right now. What time is it? 11.35. 11.35, all right, somebody stole my car and replaced it with one that isn't that good. I don't know if that, that wouldn't be a crisis that I necessarily no. hear very often. Can you give some examples, Joe? Of something we more likely to hear? Sure. You know, and, and so much of it is, is absolutely situational, and that's and that's a big piece of it too. Um, individual in crisis, as Kelly had mentioned earlier. Let's say you have you have an individual that you're working with, who for whatever reason, one of the ones that, that frequently comes up is a lack of access to food. I can't feed my kid. You're the agency that I am working with. I can't feed myself. This is all your fault. That's a crisis. It's a crisis for them. The, you know, what do you do in that situation? How do you address it? You're not giving me housing. I say call Dash. Call Jeff. Yes. So then what do I say? Yeah. 
But sometimes it's what have you tried? So whether it's the you know the tracker on the arm or the voice of the sure. like what have you tried before? So let's see what they've done. Maybe they've done nothing, but maybe they've done some very realistic things. So yeah. you know it, it's it's it goes back to communication and listening. So if you can prevent it from being here by trying to figure it out here, but without the criticism, with the body language, we want to prevent that. But sometimes we start with people that are in crisis, right? They walk in and they're already heightened. So that's the calm, right? Maybe not internally calm, but you're calm. Because if you're calmer, if you start with them, sit down, calm down, that's not going to help them. So sometimes it's just saying, I'm here, I'm going to give you a minute, can you help me figure out how to be helpful? Sometimes they don't want you to be helpful, so what can I do right now? Somebody was, the, the police said, he had an intervention with the police, he was in my office yelling and screaming for 20 minutes, and he finally said, I don't want you to do anything, just listen to me. And I did, and then he left. Like that was all, because figuring out what somebody really wants, and often it's being heard. You know, and just going back to the very beginning, everyone here has been in the field for at least a couple of years. And over those couple of years, I describe it personally as my spidey sense. I trust my spidey sense. When your own intuition is telling you that something about this situation isn't right, that should be an early identification that you're either looking at a potential problem or that there's something going on around you that you are picking up on that you may not yet have actually physically seen. So I, you know, that's one of the first things that I would tell people as in the subject of safety is trust your spidey sense. I think that that's really important. Those of us who have been, you know, working in, in this field one way or another, you know, those are the things that you learn. But then you also, as we've talked about, you can't identify the crisis in front of you. The person in crisis has to help you and them identify it together. And that's really, if there's one thing to take away from this, is that although I have a spidey sense, I also know I'm not the superhero. And that if there's a crisis in front of me, it's something that we have to find a way to work out together. Um, so I think that that's, uh, you know, that, that's one of the things that we all need to remember, too. Um, as we're getting close to the end of the hour, or three hours, or two and a half hours, just very quickly, any other questions, any other thoughts? I think I'm going to open it up for a little bit and just see who has questions or thoughts. Other training topics they might be interested in. Oh, and other training topics you might be interested in. Thanks, Kelly. Thoughts, questions, feedback? Learn anything new? Yeah. Did you learn anything new today? Who, oh, Lisa? Yes, I hope you learned something new today. It's really funny because Lisa is a former TV reporter. And interestingly enough, as a TV reporter, she would be sent into some of the situations that we've been talking about for the last two and a half hours. So it's just, it's just interesting to think about it's not just us. Uh, So, topics, going forward, what else would you want a training on? Have you all done motivational interview training? Yes? Raise your hand if you have, because it's one of the things we're talking about. Okay, so some have, but there's... Have you done something called brief action planning, which uses the spirit of motivational interview? No? And it, it actually, so it, we tried to do that once. And so brief action yeah. planning actually uses all of the motivational interviewing, but it's really coming up with a concrete plan. So as a supervisor, I use it with my staff. So the, the premise, and there's this, you know, this pattern that you walk through. So somebody wants to lose weight or somebody wants to get a job. Like, so what do they already know? What have they tried? Do they have any ideas? If they don't have any ideas, can you help them? Let's set a time frame to do that. Then there's some feedback. So the, it's actually it's it's a little prescribed, but it's really people have found it very helpful because it's and there's a check back. So that's you can use the spirit of motivational interviewing, and it's a very concrete. They call it brief action planning. There's a form people can get. They leave with something. What they're going to do, what you're going to do, what somebody else is going to do, and people have found that helpful for their service planning, for their goal planning, and also then they can take it to their other providers, saying this is what. I'm working on with my care manager. Okay, that, that's a good one too. And it's okay. an evidence-based, blah, 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 you know, all those things that are important. 
So, you know, we have a lot of people who live with complicated lives. So one of the trainings that I do is about helping people develop a healthcare proxy. Um, so healthcare proxy is actually, you have to talk about death. And not everybody's comfortable about talking about death. So then, so, you know, if I look at our residential records, we offer a healthcare proxy, they all say client refuse, client refuse. Because my guess is that the staff don't know how to have those conversations. So, you know, it, what, with the two examples we give. So if, I go, if Joe goes to a baseball game today and he gets hit on the head and he's unconscious for three days, a healthcare proxy is gonna help him for that little crisis. If something drastic happens, a healthcare proxy is thinking about longer term and end of life care. So they're really hard topics to have, but they're really important with our people, with our work.